it won't be anything. So anyway, um, all right. So monetary theory and policy, we're gonna start talking about the Federal Reserve Bank, the Fed, and really what their involvement is in helping to make some of these corrections. They're doing it now um, in the current situation. Um, we can't talk about monetary policy without talking about the market for money. And this kind of a weird thing to talk about because you're like the demand and supply of money. Yeah, it's a thing. There are markets, uh, just like any other market for money, for currency, if you will. And so we have to start this conversation by talking about the supply and demand or the market for money. So what's the demand for money? Well, that's kind of a silly question. What's your demand for money? Well, we all like money. We all want money. Um, this is a little bit different when we talk about the demand for money. We're talking about the demand for cash money, for liquid cash money. And so that's a little different relationship than, hey, do you like money? Do you demand money? Do you want it? Do you? It's, it's a relationship between the cost of money and how much cash money then you and I want to have on hand depending on the cost of money. What's the cost of money? Well, what does it cost to get money that you don't have is interest. You have to pay for it, right? Um, that's really what we're talking about here. So we're talking about the relationship between interest or what you have to pay to borrow money or how much you want that cash money in your pocket. So it's a relationship between those two things. Um, just being really clear, we're talking about cash liquid money sort of those more like in the M1 range of, of assets. Hang on a minute. All right, there we go. Why do people demand money? Why do people want cash money? Well, the first thing is it's our medium of exchange, right? Um, it's how we buy things. It's how you get the things that you need and the things that you want. It allows us to carry, on, carry out economic transactions, it allows you to pay me, me to pay you, again, us to buy the things that we need. Um, cash is the most liquid type of money. It's, it's already liquid. So it's not like a piece of real estate or a car or a stock or something that you need to buy to get the cash out. It just already is cash. So People like cash, why? Because it's a medium of exchange and it allows them to quickly and easily buy the things that they want or need, period. You know, right? So money demand in the interest rate. Okay, so the quantity of money that you and I demand to keep in our pockets should be directly related to interest rates. For example, if I have $10,000, cash money and the interest rate is low which means i'm not going to make that much money on my money i might just hang on to it because the opportunity cost right isn't very high i'm not going to lose that much interest if the interest rates are low and i loan out my money i'm actually not going to get that much in return and so eh, i might just hang on to it right now on the flip side, if I have $10,000 that I'm willing to loan up and interest rates are really high, if I hang on to that money, I'm actually losing a, a greater deal of money. And so I might think twice about actually hanging on to my money because the cost of hanging on to my money is high because I'm losing all that interest. And so it's kind of this inverse relationship, if you will. When interest rates are low, my, my demand for money is going to be pretty high and vice versa. This goes along with what we already know about demand curves and that there's, they're downward sloping, that there's an inverse relationship between quantity and price. It's a little different because we're talking about money, right? Money's a little different than a loaf of bread or something else, but still has a demand curve. It's going to look pretty similar to you. It's going to be downward sloping. Okay, so when interest rates are low, my demand for money is high, my own money. I'll just keep it um, or vice versa. 
So if I was going to draw a demand curve for money, don't overthink this. Okay, don't overthink this. If I was going to draw a demand curve for money, draw a market for money, this is what it would look like. You can see quantity is always on the x-axis where you would expect it to be, and price is along the y where you expect it to be. In this case, the price of money is the interest. And in my case, or our case, our demand for liquid cash money has an inverse relationship with the amount of interest we could earn if we loaned out that money. Okay. So now let's talk about the money supply. This is where the Fed comes into the picture, okay? Um, this is where the Fed can start to manipulate us, the economy, and the way that we act, knowing how we behave with the demand for money. The Federal Reserve Bank, the Fed, is actually the one who determines the supply of money. And so they, knowing how we are going to behave as a result, can increase or decrease the supply of money to get us to behave in the way that they know we want. Okay. Um, so the supply of money, A, is determined by the Fed. Federal Reserve Bank is the one who decides how much physical cash money is in circulation in our economy. They decide, okay? It's what we call a stock variable. We've talked about stock, stock numbers, stock variables before. It's, it's an actual number. At any given point in time, to some, to some degree, the Fed knows how much money is in circulation. Yeah, you and I, you know, we might accidentally drop money in the trash can or in the fireplace or whatever. And it, so obviously it's not gonna be exact, but they have a pretty good idea of how much money is in supply and in circulation in our economy at any given point in time. And I know there's an actual number someplace, right? The Fed has that number. That's the number of dollars that are in circulation. It's a stock variable. At any given point in time, we should be able to say an exact number. It is a vertical supply curve, because we're gonna put it on a graph. It is a vertical line because the amount of money supplied is not determined by some other factor. It is the supply of money that determines other things. But nothing determines the supply of money except for that's what the Federal Reserve Bank has decided the supply of money is gonna be. Yeah, they have their reasons. They have speculation. They have economic theory. They have a lot of other things, but it really doesn't depend on anything except for the decision made by the Fed, period. And it's their decision they get to make, okay? So now let's bring the supply of money and the demand of money together and look at it as a market for money. Okay, so you can see here that's that same downward sloping demand curve. Okay, and there is, you can see where it says M, we have that perfectly vertical line where it says S, supply of M for money, supply of money, demand of money, where they intersect determines what the interest rate will be. What's the price of money? Well, it depends on the supply and demand of money, depends on the price of money. Right? So in many cases, it's really like any other market. It has an equilibrium, uh, has an equilibrium price. In this case, the price is when you take that interest rate and you apply it towards some dollar amount, the price is what you have to pay extra in order to borrow that money. Okay? All right. If the Fed, in this case, increases the money supply, okay? It's an increase in the money supply. It doesn't matter how much, right? You can see if we go from S to S prime, you can see we go from point A as our equilibrium to point B, you can see what happens to the interest rates when the supply of money is increased. It goes down. Okay, when there's a greater supply really of anything, the price goes down. So money's not that different from anything else in a market in our economy. It's pretty much the same, right? And so 
if the Fed wants to decrease interest rates, right, they can do it by simply increasing the money supply and waiting for you and I to react to that increase in the money supply. Now, today's the day I promised you we're going to talk about how the Fed actually does that how they actually increase the money supply. We talked about it briefly last time when we talked about open market operations. Today, we're gonna kind of bring it full circle, okay? Any questions up till this point? I promise I'm leading you someplace specific. All right, I'm gonna assume we're good. Okay, money and aggregate demand. Okay. This obviously is the place we have to come to when we talk about monetary policy. When we talked about fiscal policy and how the government can change their spending or decrease our tax or increase, right? Increase or decrease our spending or our taxes in order to change our spending. Really, in the end, it was all about manipulating aggregate demand. This is the exact same thing, the exact same thing, except being done by the Fed and not by the federal government. In the next chapter, we're going to do a pretty in-depth comparison on the two different types of policies. Because while they end up doing the same thing, they're a bit different, OK? So here it says, money affects the economy through changes in the interest rate. It isn't the money itself being injected, OK? Um, it's that money supply, yeah, that does create spending, but it also has the impact of decreasing interest rates. And when we decrease interest rates, the component of aggregate expenditure that we then can impact is that I, that investment piece. Investment is a component of aggregate expenditure and therefore aggregate demand. Right? So if we can change overall spending, then we change the demand for the goods and services that we're spending the money on. Right? So it's a component of aggregate expenditure and therefore is also a component of aggregate demand. Okay? So up till this point, we talked about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy can impact to the C or the G, the consumption or the government spending. Now we're addressing the I, which is, the third real component, we do have net exports, but remember that's just an adjustment that we do, so we don't mess with that too much. Nothing we can really do about that um, unless we want to, like, yeah, that's too political for us to go into imports and exports. But that covers the C and the I and the G now, right? The I can be affected through monetary policy. So this is a pretty genius slide, okay? And after we get done with this, I'm gonna switch to like a little whiteboard and I'm gonna write some things on there for you that I think are gonna be, it's, it's profound in terms of the amount of information I'm gonna give you in just a couple of lines and how much that's gonna help you on your final exam, okay? But what you can see here is an initial demand curve for money, the supply and the demand, and that equilibrium of A. So what we've done in the next graph is actually come up with a demand for investment market. Yeah, it's a thing, okay, it's a thing. Um, there is a direct correlation between quantity and price when it comes to interest rates. They have an inverse relationship. When interest rates are high, you and I don't invest very much. When they're low, you and I invest more. We like things at lower prices. You already know that, right? No, you've never seen a market demand curve for investment or a market supply curve for investment. It's okay. Don't worry about it. You haven't seen one for thousands of other goods as well or services. This is just, it's just a, an illustration of the information, right? So if we take that information, right, interest rate information that we found on that first graph, A, right, and we put it onto our market B, our market for investment, we have a demand curve for investment, right, and that's just going to be one point on it. 
And then that also translates into some amount of demand. When you and I borrow money, we typically spend it. Why would you borrow money you weren't going to spend, right? And so at some price level, you and I buy some quantity of GDP, and some of that money is borrowed, right? And so now let's show how that increase in the money supply increases these other things. These graphs in and of themselves are not important. We're just illustrating for you what happens in all of these markets through this change in the money supply, but we're gonna break it down and we're just gonna get down to the basics with this. Don't worry about these graphs, okay? So if we shift money supply to the right, which means the Fed has decided to increase the amount of money in our supply, okay? That would bring interest rates down. When we take that new interest rate that we found there at point B on the first graph, and we plot our point on the demand for investment graph, we can see that the amount of investment along the x-axis has gone up. Interest rates went down, investment went up. That's what we wanted to happen, right? That's the whole idea. And then as a result, aggregate demand, demand in total, right? Because this is a, a component of aggregate expenditure. So aggregate expenditure is going up, but also, right? More spending means more demand for goods and services, okay? So that's gonna then shift our aggregate demand curve to the right, an increase in investment, okay? Again, don't overthink this. This is where I am going to switch to a whiteboard. You are going to want to write this down, okay? I've been practicing on the whiteboard. It's comical and I apologize. Um, but I will try and use like the best handwriting I possibly can to show you this, okay? So how does the Fed change the supply of money? Through what we call, and we talked about this last week, open market operations, open market operation. So open market operations. Open market operations is the buying and selling of U.S. debt, U.S. bonds, U.S. securities, however you want to say that, right? So they can sell these IOUs from the government to investors. It's big, right? Um, and it's a big job. It's a big job. So check this out, okay? I'm about to sum up a lot of information for you just on this one whiteboard. So make sure you're paying attention or that you take a photo afterwards or something like that. So if the Fed through open market operations buys, sorry, buys bonds, right? Because that's part of open market operations. If they buy bonds, it makes the money supply bigger. Okay, so through open market operations, when the government buys bonds, it makes the money supply bigger. How does that happen? Because they're buying a bond for me or you or a company or something like that. And when they buy something from me, they're giving me money. They're taking the bond back. That puts money in my bank account. And then remember that uh, sort of money multiplication happens in our banking system. Right, so we've talked about this. These, this would be a new injection of money into our system. So when the Fed is increasing the money supply, they're not just printing money and dropping it from an airplane, right? They're injecting it somehow. This is how they inject it. They inject it through open market operations, buying bonds is how they would make the money supply bigger. In order to this, this buying the bonds and making the money supply bigger is what they would do in the case of a recessionary, sorry guys, geez, a recessionary gap, okay? So they would do this to close a recessionary gap. So check this out. Maybe, let me try the draw tool instead, see if that's any better. Um, in this case, the money supply right, the money supply would go up, okay? 
when the money supply goes up, the interest rate, in this case, we're gonna use a lowercase i, interest rates go down, I just showed you this, okay? Interest rates go down. When interest rates go down, investment goes up. Money's cheaper to borrow, so we're gonna borrow more of it, right? Investment goes up. And then that investment is a component. Sorry, this is so much better. Um, aggregate expenditure, right, is also gonna go up because investment is part of aggregate expenditure. So obviously then the sum is gonna change. And that is going to in turn drive up aggregate demand. That increasing aggr aggregate demand close a recessionary gap? Of course it does. It's what fiscal policy did as well, okay? So to close a recessionary gap, we can implement fiscal policy, that's fine, right? The government can do that, that's great. Or, and or, the Fed can step in and increase the money supply through open market operations by buying this bonds and therefore making the money supply bigger. Chances are, in an economy like we have at this very moment, you're getting both. You're getting fiscal policy and monetary policy all at the same time. Every single morning, even when the economy is good, even when you and I are like, there wouldn't be any fiscal or monetary policy right now. There might be, right? Because economists see things coming way before the rest of the general public see something coming. There is a phone call, I believe, every single morning between the Federal Reserve Bank and I don't, I don't know if it's if it's the the Oval Office. I doubt it. It's probably um, to a group of economic advisors at the White House, um, where they talk about if the the need for any fiscal or monetary policy, because this is something that has to be planned together. It's not like the Fed's making decisions and the government's making decisions, and they're not talking to each other about it. That would be catastrophic. Instead, they talk to each other, they decide which one is more effective or if they want to use a combination of the two, okay? I'm actually going to, I guess I can save this. Maybe I'll try and post it someplace, I don't know. I'm going to clear this right now. So if you want to take a picture, take a picture, but remember it's on the video as well. Um, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the opposite. We're gonna talk about um, expansionary gaps, okay? So again, through open market operations, okay? If we have an expansionary gap, the Fed would do the opposite, right? Instead of buying bonds, they would sell bonds, right? And in this case, selling bonds, let's talk about what selling a bond would do, right? If they're gonna sell a bond, they're gonna sell it to me. They're gonna sell it to you. They're gonna sell it to a company. They're gonna sell it to an investment firm, right? When somebody sells me something, they actually take money, right? And in the case of the Fed, they take it out of the system and put it in their vault or whatever, right? And so it actually takes money out of our money supply when they sell us something. So in this case, right, it will make the money supply smaller. So, <laughs> sorry, this is absurd, okay? That's how you keep those two straight. When they buy, it gets bigger. When they sell, it gets smaller, okay? Um, and in that case, right, we would see the exact opposite things happen. So in this case, the money supply would go down. When the money supply goes down, interest, that's the lowercase i, right, goes up. We are making something more scarce, if you will, money, which drives up the price of money, which means then we would see investment 
uppercase I, that component of aggregate expenditure, go down, which means that aggregate expenditure is also going down, okay? Which means that it's gonna take demand with it because if you and I aren't spending, we don't need stuff to spend it on, right? So aggregate demand is gonna go down. There is so much information on just these last two whiteboards that I've done for you. This could cover 10 plus questions on your final exam. If this happens, this will happen. If this happens, what happens next? If we change interest, what happens to aggregate expenditure? If the Fed sells bonds, what happens to the money supply? I mean, like all of these are potential questions. A, you have to know that's called open market operations. You gotta know the definition. I will make sure I test you on that. And then I will walk you through these two different scenarios for monetary policy. And I'll ask you all sorts of little bits and pieces of what I just showed you on really these two, these two whiteboards, okay? Make sure you know them or have them available, right, for your final exam. Okay. So, sorry, give me just a minute so I can share with you again. Okay, so here we are, right? I just showed you in a couple of lines everything that I've written here right, all those really that, that cause and effect that happens through open market operations, if you will. All right, um, so now we need to look at aggregate supply, okay? Um, we know that when you shift aggregate demand, it changes, um, going to change your equilibrium and things like that. So this is really that conversation, if you will. Okay. So here you've seen this, you've seen this before. You've probably seen this exact same uh, graph, not only when we talked about the economy doing self-correction through um, changes in supply, right? which this was a common thing people got wrong on the last worksheet. And the economy self-corrects, it's through a, a, a shift of the supply curve. Remember self-correction supply, um, that's an important thing to remember. And a lot of people got that wrong. So if you don't know that, you should know that. Um, but when it comes to discretionary policy, discretionary fiscal policy, discretionary monetary policy, it happens in a shift of the demand curve. This, this graph looks exactly like the fiscal policy graph. Exactly, it's gonna shift the same, everything's gonna happen the same, we're gonna close the gap the same, everything's the same except the driving force behind it. So the graph looks the same, this is not a new graph. If you understood fiscal policy, you are fine with monetary policy because the graphs look exactly the same. It's just a different driver, right? So in this case, using expansionary monetary policy instead of expansionary fiscal policy, right? If we were going to close a recessionary gap, we would buy bonds, make the money supply bigger, drive up money supply, drive down interest rates, drive up investment, drive up expenditure, drive up demand. That shifts the demand curve to the right, okay? Closes that gap. In the meantime, We've closed the gap, but we've also created something that maybe was unintended, and that in this case is going to be 5% inflation. Okay? But it happened with fiscal policy too. Two, you can't have it all. You can't increase demand without increasing inflation. Okay? It's a thing. Um, but looks exactly the same as fiscal policy, no difference at all. Okay? All right, so we're just switching gears a tiny bit. Um, in the long run, supply is fixed at potential output, supply, aggregate supply. I probably should have put aggregate supply in there. Um, 
in the long run, aggregate supplies fix the potential. You know that no matter what happens in the short run, we can have recessionary gaps, we can have expansionary gaps. In the long run, when we all have time to adjust to everything, we come back to potential output. Um, with inflation, right, a lot of the times, because most of the time, most of the time, we are in peculiar times, and I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen, but most of the time, um, we do see inflation. It's normal because people are making more money, right? There are more goods available. You and I are demanding more stuff, et cetera, right? Um, so there's more physical dollars in circulation because, well, prices go up, so does your income, right? So. Um, so we have something that, that we have to consider, and it's called the equation of exchange. Equation of exchange is exactly what you're seeing right there. Money times velocity equals price level times real GDP. What is the velocity of money? If you were to take an actual dollar bill, an actual dollar bill. And actually, sometimes I know you guys don't carry a lot of dollar bills anymore, but um, there are actually like some dollar bills have been stamped with a website or something. People actually like to track dollar bills sometimes, and I don't know exactly who does it. Anyway, someone's doing his research or whatever. And you log in and you put where that where that dollar bill is at this point in time or whatever. Because a physical dollar bill changes location very quickly, right? It circulates, it moves. That brings, that brings velocity into the question. Velocity of money is how many times does one single dollar bill circulate through an economy in a given year? So we know that dollar doesn't just buy one thing one time. That dollar bill changes hands and actually is part of buying lots of different things over its lifetime. I think the life expectancy of a dollar bill is a couple of years, a year or two, right? So um, over that period of time, it buys a lot of things. Well, the velocity is how many times that dollar bill changed hands in the form of a purchase over a given year. Now, I calculated what I thought to be the velocity of money um, based on information, the best information I could get um, a couple of years ago, and it was about an eight here in the United States, right? Because I actually could fill in some of these blanks that you see right here in this equation, and I could back into velocity. I had an idea of how much money was in circulation. I went on the Fed's website or I contacted a researcher at the Fed and they gave me the number, I can't remember. Um, and then price level times real GDP is actually nominal GDP. It's a nominal, right? Um, nominal is this year's GDP. So it's the GDP with the inflation still in it, okay? Remember price levels about inflation and real GDP it's about GDP without inflation. So if you multiply them together, you're sort of putting the inflation back into the GDP. Anyway, don't, don't get too crazy about that. But on the right side of that equal sign for the equation of exchange, it actually could say nominal GDP instead. So I could figure out what nominal GDP was. I thought I had a good idea of how much money was in circulation. And so I came up with a velocity of about eight. Um, I'm mildly interesting, right? That an average dollar bill circulates eight times in an economy. The higher your velocity, the more spending that's happening in your economy, right? What determines velocity? What determines how quickly a dollar can change hands, right? Now, we don't use dollar bills the same way that we used to, right? Um, and so we do have a lot of dollars in the system that are electronic, but they still do get transferred, if you will. Like that physical dollar that's sitting in your checking account, when you swipe your debit card, it does change hands. It's a physical dollar that actually existed at one point in time when you deposited your check or whatever, 
Um, and it's now changed hands. We can't neglect that that's really an actual dollar that changed hands. Um, and so we do include that in velocity, right? But electronic transmissions is probably the biggest thing in any economy that has sped up the velocity of money or the rate at which money can change hands in, in terms of purchasing, right? It allows us to quickly purchase and repurchase. And um, when we purchase something from someone, they can quickly then go around, you know, go to another round of spending within literally seconds, right? Um, you do that Venmo thing, right? As soon as you send me my Venmo, I can turn around and send it to somebody else. So it helps to circulate the money. The number of pay periods also is a huge determinant in velocity. The more often people are paid, the higher the velocity of money. Typically here in the US, it's every two weeks. If you are in an economy where it's traditional to get paid every week or you do get paid every week, velocity is gonna be higher. People are gonna turn around and spend that money really as soon as they get it. Um, and money is a store of value. Um, our money does store value which actually slows down the velocity a little bit. If you are dealing with currency with really high inflation rates, you wanna get it out of your hands as quickly as possible, we do save some of it. Um, and because it's a store of value, maybe it's the US dollar because the US dollar is a store of value, sometimes that does slow us down a little bit. How stable is velocity? I would know this fact, right? M1 velocity is fairly unstable. Um, cause that's your cash money. That's the money that if you're going to spend, you're going to spend it now, um, or not. Right. I think the velocity of money is slowing down a little bit here in the U S on M1 because people maybe don't have as much M1, right. And are being a little bit more careful with their M1. M2 is a little bit more stable. Yeah. M2 does include M1, but M2 includes all sorts of other stuff too that is the second monies that we spend. Money's in a savings account, money in a CD, money in some sort of a money market account. So it's a little slower. And so it takes that crazy M1 piece and just mellows it out a little bit. Okay, but I would know that if I were you. It's a question I like to ask. Um, the quantity theory of money, again, don't get too crazy about this. I don't even know if you have a homework question on this. Um, if the velocity of money is stable, Changes in the money supply have a predictable effect. So this, this is another, you know, just like your simple spending multiplier would theoretically make fiscal policy easy to predict. If the velocity of money stable is stable, it should also, um, monetary theory, monetary policy should be predictable. Now the problem is, the velocity of money and the simple spending multiplier have this this huge unknown and it's people it's you and me um we're not always predictable you can't always predict what the people are going to do in terms of spending in terms of velocity okay so for example if money supply increases by five percent and velocity is stable then gdp will also increase by five percent an increase in the money supply results in increase in spending in the long run, eventually increasing the price level because it creates inflation, right? But we already know that. We know that spending demand increases prices, and creates inflation. Again, I, I, don't, I don't really see myself giving you a quantity theory of money problem on your, on your final. Okay, so what is the target for monetary policy? Well, in the short run, it's to do something with those interest rates. So changing the money supply to really target those interest rates. Why? To, to target investment, that component of aggregate expenditure. So it's pretty simple. Interest impacts investment. Investment is one of the key components of aggregate expenditure. That's why monetary policy works, because it targets the right thing. In the long run, monetary policy can also impact price levels. 
So that's like a secondary impact, right? And so monetary policy, because the Fed is run by economists, which is different than the federal government, right? Economists do really think about these types of things. What's the short-term impact? What's the long-term impact? What are the trade-offs? What's the cost? What's the benefit, right? Um, and so monetary policy, and I have a video I want you to watch um, that I posted, it's, and it's, it's the best, best econ video I have. Um, and it's an announcement by Ben Bernanke, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the recession of 2008 to 10 or whatever. Um, and he really explains monetary policy probably better than I ever could. And, and he talks about the trade-offs and he talks about how, you know, the Fed has a lot of considerations. Um, these are contrasting policies, right? You know that if you increase demand, you're going to increase price level. If you decrease demand, you're going to decrease price level. It's trying to keep that all in check. It's trying to create a balance between the short run and the long run, which isn't necessarily something that the federal government thinks about. Um, so let's just talk about a little bit of monetary policy over the years. Um, feds always use the interest rates sort of as the primary tool. They can also, remember, change your reserve rates, the amount, the required reserves that the banks are required to keep. They could make them lower, which increases multiplication. Remember, ours are so low already, it's ridiculous. They can't, you can't go much lower than 0% and 2%, right? But they could. Um, but it talks a little bit about the recession, 2007, 2009. Um, and the Bernanke video will talk about this. I'm telling you, if you watch one video, make it this one. And there's a question on your worksheet on the video, so I'm sort of forcing you to do it. Um, but it's a great video. Uh, it's like 15 minutes. Um, during the recession, the Fed invested in mortgage-backed securities. So all of those mortgages that were no longer good, investors had bought into those mortgages as an investment tool, essentially creating this huge problem in our banking system and in our investment, financial investment system. Um, the Fed came in and did the craziest stuff. They loaned money to other countries. They, um, they bailed out all sorts of banks and producers and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, Bernanke will talk about it. It's really interesting. Um, the other thing that the Fed, because the Fed really, remember, it's run by economists, which makes it a little superior, I think, and not all economists would agree. Um, I think it makes it a little superior in terms of thinking through the cause and effect of decisions, I think. Um, so the Fed also takes into consideration the international economy, the global economy. And the example um, down here, that I have on the slide is about providing loans to Mexico, especially during the recession. Mexico is located right next to us. There's no denying that, right? And what happens in the US economy is gonna impact Mexico perhaps first um, and most directly. Yeah, what happens in the US affects the entire world, but um, stabilizing economies close to us in physical proximity is also a pretty good strategy in stabilizing our economy, right? Um, anyway, 